this slide. There we go. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the book launch of The Systems Work for Social Change, how to harness connection, context, and power to cultivate deep and enduring change. I am uh, Francois Bonici, the director of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship and head of social innovation at the World Economic Forum. Uh, along with my co-author, Cynthia Rayner, we are delighted to welcome you and thank you all for coming today. Um, we're grateful to be hosted today by the Schwab Foundation at the World Economic Forum, where also we host the COVID Response Alliance for Social Entrepreneurs. And our special co-host and partner for today is Catalyst 2030, a global movement of social entrepreneurs and change makers working towards the sustainable development goals and systemic change. The work of this book only exists because of a, because of a greater community. 
many circles of interconnecting peers and actors learning and doing side by side. And because of what we found under the surface, working alongside incredible organizations and individuals. We have special thanks for the Bertha Foundation and the Bertha Center for Social Innovation at the University of Cape Town, the Schwab Foundation and the Motsepe Foundation that supported uh, some initial research in a report called Beyond Organizational Scale. And of course, many of the organizations you saw on the slideshow at the beginning, uh, the many peers and experts as well who guided us along the way, many of whom are here today. We thank you all. In some ways, this work harks back to some long-standing traditions and ways of organizing and working in solidarity for greater agency. But in other ways, it points a direction to how to do this in a modern age. The spirit of today and today's session is the same as the philosophy of the book and of the Schwab Foundations, and that is to let practitioners lead the way. Cynthia and I are here and have been here to surface and amplify their stories and to bring an emphasis to the deep relational work towards the system change conversation. So for today's session, this is a webinar. So please use the chat to uh, say hello and make comments. Please use the Q&A function if you'd like to pose questions or vote on questions to, uh, that our moderator will pose to our special guest today. And please follow the conversation on social media using the hashtag systems work and the handles at Schwab Foundation and at Catalyst 2030. I'm honored today to welcome all of our special guests by turning on their video and introducing, firstly, our moderator for today, Cheryl Dorsey, the president of Echoing Green. Cheryl is a medical doctor, social justice and racial justice activist, social entrepreneur, foundation leader, uh, and general role model uh, for me. Uh, welcome, Cheryl. And thanks for being here today. I will quickly introduce the other speakers and then hand over to you, Mirai Chatterjee, the chairperson of the Self-Employed Women's Association uh, Cooperative Federation, has been with CIWA for decades, a leading researcher uh, in uh, social justice and public health uh, advocate. Um, also on the board of the Schwab Foundation, Mirai, welcome and thank you. Uh, Jeru Bilamoria, please join us on, on video. Uh, the, co-founder of One Family Foundation, Catalyst 2030, Child and Youth Finance International, Aflatoon, Childline India, and many others, a serial social entrepreneur and general uh, cheerleader for this movement uh, and someone we have learned so much from. Welcome, Jeru. Uh, Frank Beadle de Palomo, uh, another uh, wonderful uh, colleague and leader uh, in the HIV AIDS space, uh, the president of Mothers to Mothers, Welcome, Frank. Please turn on your video. And uh, finally, uh, Cynthia Rayner, my co-author, uh, senior researcher uh, at the Bertha Center for Social Innovation and, uh, uh, and my dear colleague, uh, who I'm very grateful for. So uh, please follow the conversation here uh, and on social media. We're also live streaming. There are several hundred people uh, registered for today and looking forward to, to everyone participating. Um, and just a last reminder that we will be um, also translating uh, this webinar on Wordly. They should have a link in the chat that is translated into 16 languages and transcribed uh, into other languages. Now that's all from me. Uh, Cheryl, uh, thank you for hosting this conversation today with us. Francois, thank you so much and welcome everyone. I uh, know that you all are as excited as I am to have this hour together with these extraordinary authors and social entrepreneurs who will make the discussion more fulsome. So I think we're just gonna get right to it. Um, but let me just say a few words about the systems work of systems change. Um, the work that Francois and Cynthia have done is part of a long trajectory of social change making. As you read the book, you will be um, taken on a journey of 200 years of social change making. Um, but also brought into a conversation that Francois and Cynthia were a part of that began about seven or eight years ago, when despite apparent successes, many of the founders and leaders who are part of today's conversations 
uh, continued to feel that despite their successes, that their responses still felt inadequate to the size of the challenge. And by that time, several of them beca became quite interested in this concept of systems change. And the question then became how to translate that into action. Francois and Cynthia were part of that conversation, part of that journey, which led to this important book, The Systems Work of Systems Change. Um, that really brings us today, as we all have navigated um, and uh, tried to get through an extraordinary year and a half where a global pandemic has claimed the lives of millions, um, really destroyed the economic livelihoods of hundreds of millions, and really reversed so many uh, trends of progress over the last few decades. What I think they write so beautifully about towards the end of the book is not only is this a, a economic political issue, but also a social issue. How this pandemic, how racial reckoning um, and, and conversations around racial inequities around the globe have begun to touch and change the societal psyche. Right, sort of this interrogation of the narratives in which we're all immersed um, when they're no longer serving us, when in fact, as Cynthia and Francois share, that they become, uh, it becomes clear that they are a fallacy, that it's clear that they are no longer working for enough of us. And that's what the book really gets into um, and how organizations like those represented by these social entrepreneurs today are interrogating and challenging and leading the way forward. Now, I will tell you, I've read the book now a couple of times, and it is written with a profound and confident, and it's written in a whisper, but it lands with a roar. Please make no mistake. This book, if you carefully listen to it, um, is a radical reframing of how Francois and Cynthia think that we all need to work to imagine a more just future. Um, and again, the revolutionary um, language and framing, I think is so important. And I hope in this moment when there's been a crack in the universe about how we think the world is working and more importantly, how it is not working, I hope that their words land. You're going to hear things uh, in this book and hear from them today, um, radical notions that they actually believe that systems cannot be fixed. They actually believe that systems work is less about ambitious outcomes and more about setting up the process through which further adaptation can happen. They are really raising up a number of funders who are uh, bravely confronting their own power and considering how they can shift some of this power to primary actors in their systems of influence. And one of the biggest shifts that they look to funders to do um, is undoing the sector-wide conditioning to get things done, but rather get us to begin to focus on bringing in the voices of different actors. This is profoundly radical. I hope you will take that away. And they are important messengers in the, in the vein of Margaret Wheatley and so many others. And I'm so deeply hopeful that in this moment of profound tumult, that we have the courage and the ability to listen. So with that being said, I would love to bring in our wonderful authors, Cynthia and Francois, and please set the stage for us, you two. Can you both tell us how you came to write the book and then give us a brief overview, which will then set us up for the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I'm just, yes, I can be heard, okay. Um, Cheryl, thank you so much for this great setup. You're making my heart beat faster because you're saying the things that we were thinking about while we were writing this book. And, and really it was born out of um, fr frustration, um, a, a bit of a sense of failure, um, and even some fear. Um, we, we were part of, like you said, that systems change conversation. And it was largely, this was six, seven years ago, coming out of the global north. And we were realizing that a lot of this conversation about systems change was uh, revealing issues of complexity, certainly issues of scale, but the issues of social justice, of power, of depth, the historical underpinnings of the social problems that we live with, we didn't feel like we're being addressed. We were sitting in the context of South Africa and in the, in the broader global South, and we were witnessing organizations that were dealing uh, very much on a daily basis with these particular issues, 
using very tried and true practices, issues like Francois said that come from history, but they weren't being brought into the conversation. These are practices that come from community organizing, from social activism. Um, but instead, the Global North conversation was feeling very clinical. It was feeling as if we could just use top-down solutions and if we could get them spread far and wide in a cookie cutter like fashion that we were going to change systems for the better and we were forgetting we felt that we were part of the systems that we were trying to change um, and in fact that it's people that make up systems um, not just systems maps or leverage points or intervening points so we really tried to bring those voices into the conversation. That was the purpose behind this book. It wasn't about our voices. It was about the voices of everyone you see on this screen and many, many other voices um, that, that we wanted to bring to the fore. Um, we really wanted to tell the stories of what we saw working because we felt like those answers were right um, beneath our very nose and that we weren't bringing them into the conversation. Um, and we wanted to just lift up those practices that we were seeing that were working in the context in which we were present. Wonderful. Francois, maybe a few um, thoughts from you and then we'll ask you, uh, to, you two to walk through um, the principles and the practices that the book elucidates. Thanks so much. Uh, I think Cynthia captured it, it really well. Uh, we, we were learning the hard way. Uh, and I think uh, South Africa, uh, as someone who grew up there, was privileged and, and benefited from it and worked as a medical doctor and recognized you know, the structural uh, and systemic barriers that, that so many people in, in my country faced every day. That's now become a global conversation. And it's something we were dealing with uh, very much and was very visible. Uh, you know, for a young doctor in a medical system to, to see that. But then also having started and worked at the Bertha Center, recognized how we were actually getting it wrong many times and we were told that. And we were also, you know, how simple solutions or, you know, social entrepreneurial solutions uh, were, were clearly not getting at, you know, the hundreds of years of, uh, of colonialism, of apartheid, um, of deep inequality of the modern era. Uh, and, and that is, you know, echoed across the world in terms of what uh, we see today. Um, uh, but then there was amazing hope in organizations like our labs that are here with us today, we'll, we'll, we'll see them later, uh, that we learned from and that we, we worked with. And you know, they became, even though we were at the university, they, they were our instructors. Uh, and um, it was uh, really uh, a, a long journey. And we started writing this just to learn for ourselves. You know? And I think then what we discovered as we went on that, what what Cynthia spoke about was hidden and what that we needed to surface was not necessarily as part of those funders conversation was not part of the conversations around what organizations told the world or even themselves or even their managers about what they were really doing uh, on a day to day basis. Um, and that was extremely powerful for us. Uh, and yeah, that that was was a was was an important set of uh, lessons along the way, uh, and just uh, again, you know, grateful that we've had that opportunity with everyone. That's terrific, and I will say, um, you two are so interesting to me, and you talk about it in the book that each of you, Francois, you as a, a practicing physician, as well as a professor, and at the Bertha Center, you, Cynthia, as a researcher, you having worked at Mothers to Mother mothers to mothers, you had one foot in the world of institutional change making, but you also had deeply rooted experience in the grassroots work of social change. And as I call that sort of systems vertigo, where you're sort of shifting between contexts, um, or I will often boundary turbulence is where some of these insights that you are mining and excavating come from. And I think that sort of positional, um, that unique position that you both found yourselves in led you to this really important book um, around what does systems work look like, the day-to-day -day principles, the three that you elucidate and the four practices that have guided the actions of the organization, some of whom are represented here. Can you all walk us through that? And that will be the predicate for the rest of the conversation. Thanks, Cheryl. I'm just going to share a few slides here, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we really want to get into the into the real crux of the organization and um, bringing voices in. But this will just help set up the conversation. Um, what what I don't think anyone will be surprised to hear and how we preface the very beginning of the book is that the social challenges that we face are complex, they're of large scale, and they are deep. 
And like I said earlier, we were very much seeing this complexity and scale conversation happening, but it was the depth that we felt was missing. Over the last year and a half, we have seen these issues of depth come to the fore and it, there are, they are no longer um, not part of the conversation. In fact, they're a big part of the conversation, but how to practically address them is still feeling like an open-ended question. We, in the very beginning of the book, and, we, and we, we struggled with whether or not we should do this because it felt like you know quite a bit of history, but we decided to go ahead and put it in and, and really look at where are we coming from? What are the 200 years of social change history that have informed our approach today? And really what we found is, is it's in that post-war period, the, in, the industrial period, where we started to apply this lens of industrial production to social change. And we believe that this strongly got us off track, that we were able to use kind of these top-down solutions to get immediate wins, but actually they left much of the deep work undone. And that actually systems change, systems change strategies rely on very relational practices, that they are about reconfiguring power and they are disruptive of the status quo. They take a long time and they require true adaptation to the context. So knowing that history, we were then able to look at all of the conversations that we have been having over many years and say, what's actually happening here? What are they doing on a day-to-day -day basis that's beneath the surface? And we looked very closely at how are they fostering connection? Any, any systems theorist will say a great way to change the system is to change a relationship in the system. But how do you actually do that? And one of the ways you do that is keep people together while they are learning together. So this act of fostering connection is actually a truly radical way of making systems change. Then embracing context. How do you ensure that what is working can work in another context or that it can be spread to another context, that you're sharing learnings across contexts? We found organizations that were doing, going to quite extraordinary lengths to ensure that problem solvers very close to the ground were able to make adaptations on a real-time basis to things that were happening in the system. And that revealed to us that process is actually far more important than outcomes, like you mentioned, Cheryl. And then finally, this piece of reconfiguration of power. We say that we want to reconfigure power, but how, do, how does that actually happen? And what does it actually look like? Power actually exists to perpetuate power. So if you want to re reverse or re-engineer power, it takes quite a radical approach, a set of radical approaches. And then beyond this, we looked deeper. So we really tried to get to the practical level. We felt like a lot of the systems change conversation was happening at this very theoretical level. We wanted to take it down to the tactical level. So we looked at practices, tactics for cultivating collectives, keeping people together while learning, um, creating collective identity, um, how do you equip problem solvers? Those adaptations, they require people who are really truly empowered to make decisions in a real-time basis at the grassroots. And then you can lift it up and you can promote platforms so that, and, and these aren't the platforms like technology platforms. Often they are technology enabled, but they are people platforms. They are ways that people connect across context to learn from one another. And finally, policies and patterns. A lot of organizations are working at that policy level, but then they do their real work when they make behavioral patterns change in a, um, in a real way. Um, just quickly, the way the book is structured so that it becomes quite practical, we look at all of our case studies at a contextual level. We go and we look at the surface work um, and you'll hear some of that today from our wonderful guests, but then we go down to the principles and the practices and the tactics. And we look at how these specific actions create deep sy systems change. I think, um, Francois, is there anything you want to add before we get um, into the real meat of the conversation? No, just recognize we're using the system change language, and that was something we were quite allergic to at the time as well. I think it's, you know, we're having that great abstract conversation, but this was really about solving problems uh, from the bottom up at a local level and empowering, you know, as, as Cynthia was speaking about, these practices that are about equipping um, people who live and, and, and breathe issues and problems in their own lives and also opportunities to actually have the power to, to, to make decisions around them. And so looking forward to the conversation with, with others um, now to, to unpack how that, that problem solving actually happened. Uh, and for us, that was this deeper work that needed to be lifted up at a time where we perhaps were getting away from you know, the reality of change with the system change conversation. And I think that's the, the, one of the key messages for us. 
Well, Cynthia, thank you for walking us through sort of the a broad overview of the book. Um, and something you said, Francois, is the perfect um, segue to our first um, respondent, our first guest, uh, Mirai Chatterjee, chairperson of the Self-Employed Women's Association Cooperative Federation. Um, Mirai wrote a beautiful foreword for this book. And Mirai, I apologize for quoting your words back to you, but I think um, I wanna share this paragraph from your foreword that I think really tees you up to have a conversation about what Francois just talked about, sort of the primacy and centrality of people, primary actors in all of this work. And you say, in the last two decades, our field has been intensely focused on scaling up, yet this preoccupation with scale and speed can have adverse consequences. Many of us face this in our daily work. As a longtime practitioner worker in CIWA, I am often asked, why are you reaching only 1.8 million in a country of 1.3 billion? We have resisted the exhortation to rush processes and go in with a cookie cutter approach. Organizing people for social change is a slow and steady process of ups and downs, of forward movements and some backward steps as well. At all times, people, especially the poorest and most vulnerable, whom the authors call primary actors, must lead and determine the pace of change. Can you take that concept, Mirai, and walk us through um, this notion of primary actors and how it harkens back to many of the principles and practices of um, Gandhi? Thanks very much, Cheryl. And first and foremost, heartiest congratulations to Francois and Cynthia for this wonderful book. And of course, all the stories and journeys therein. Congratulations to all colleagues who have enriched us uh, with their journeys and with their many learnings. I must say, Cheryl, I read the book with great joy and also feeling a resonance, you know, aha, that sounds familiar. Um, but to come to your question, um, I think when I read the book, one of the things that really stood out for me was that, I don't know if Francois and Cynthia and the other colleagues uh, you know, felt this consciously when they began their work, but what they are doing is so close to what Mahatma Gandhi called Rachnatmak Karya, or in English, constructive action. No work, no task is too small. You start small, you start local, you start democratically. And you start with people and preferably the poorest and most vulnerable like women in the center of all efforts. Um, Francois and Cynthia call people the primary actors. And I think it resonates not just with Mahatma Gandhi, but also with Martin Luther King, with Madiba and so many across the world who are from such different contexts and yet in some ways discovered and rediscovered some of these essential features of organizing people for social change, changing systems, bottom up, if you will, um, carrying people not only with them, but exhorting people to lead at their pace, at their speed, with their interests and needs always paramount. And you mentioned um, I think it was Francois or Cynthia, perhaps, who mentioned, you know, how this top-down approach has, in many ways, done us in. I'm not saying we don't need things from the top, but our experience and what we've learned from the experiences of the Indian Freedom Movement and so many other movements across the world is that you start by organizing the primary actors. They really are key. They are central to all we do, live and breathe. And we can't forget that even for one minute. And I think that comes through in all of the stories and the journeys that are in this book. And also what Francois and Cynthia tease out from all these stories and their own. So perfectly said, Mariah. You know, Mark Twain is reputed to have said, history never repeats itself, but it rhymes. And you bringing forward the work of extraordinary um, societal actors from Gandhi to King and so many others reminds us of some of the 
foundational principles of you know, decentralized work, bringing primary actors in, democratic functioning. You know, we had a question come through to the chat, which I think is so wonderful. It's from an organization called Kids for SDGs that is really looking to you as um, a, a leader in this space and, and Francois and Cynthia and what they've learned. Um, how do you translate some of the learnings of the work that you've done that are explicated in this book um, to apply to young people who are approaching social change in their community? What practical tips and lessons would you offer, Mirai? Sure, well, I think the amazing thing, and again, this comes out in the book is that in very different contexts, you know, some of the basic principles, in fact, are the same. One we've already uh, elucidated, which is starting where people are, where their needs and demands are. That should be the starting point of the journey, not something that I came up with or thought of. Um, I mean, that can also be useful. I'm not negating that. So I think uh, start where people are, go to where people are, listen. Many of us who are educated and college educated think we have answers, we have magic bullets. We need to do a lot of relearning, quite frankly. I know I had to. And for six months, for example, I just sat in one low-income informal workers settlement on the banks of the Sabarmati River in Ahmedabad and just listened to people, what were their daily struggles? What were their needs? Someone's child was sick, tuberculosis was rampant, whatever. And then start from what is also doable. You know, we can't change everything all at once. But once those needs have been identified, working with people, see what can work. Um, because we all need some uh, early breakthroughs. Um, you know, to, to propel us forward. Um, so I think those are some of, of the basic principles. Also, in our case, starting with, you know, building up local leadership, in our case, informal yes. women workers leadership, because social change is a long process. It's a marathon. It will outlive us all, frankly. And we need to have leaders and younger and younger leaders who will take forward the work and bring their own special uh, freshness and ideas to it, of course. So I think what was very important was very early on to identify local women in our case, so can be men or whatever in different contexts, who not only are insiders, so they have a direct connect in a way that some of us do, do not have, but also can make sure that the change process continues and hopefully will be sustainable. That's beautifully said. Thank you, Mirai. And before I move on um, to Frank, I will um, ask Cynthia and Francois if you'd like to add anything. Um, we heard echoes from Mirai about um, the importance of, of, of deep listening and you sort of, you two raise up this concept of small data. Uh, which is a powerful forms of inputs that really influence the way that work is done. Want to give you all the floor before I move on to Frank, um, if there's anything you'd like to add. Thanks, Cheryl, and thanks, Mirai. I, I absolutely agree about this idea of people as the center of, of all of this work. Um, that small data and also just the connections between people are what really allow that small data to transfer. So that first principle of around foster connection, again, like I said, it's simple, but it's actually profoundly important. When we talk about youth, when we talk about any community of people trying to learn from one another, that idea of collective identity, the way they see one another as a group is, is extremely important. And sometimes we overlook that because we think individual identities can supersede collective identities. But in any, in any case of big change, we've seen that people actually put aside some of their individual identities and work together as a group. That's what allows that small data to transfer. That's what allows people to really stay together while learning. And it's really um, the first step towards systems change that we saw. Yeah, Wonderful. and just jumping in there, if I may, Cheryl, the power of the collective. I mean, that comes yeah. through in the book. And that is also my own experience that we can't make social change alone. No one can, not even Mahatma Gandhi could. 
you know, it is building people and bringing them together and building the solidarity across, you know, caste, class, religious, linguistic, and geographic boundaries. Um, and that's exciting and enriching. Absolutely. So well said, Mirai. Thank you so much. Um, I want to move to um, a conversation with Frank, um, head of Mothers to Mothers. Um, Frank, the book is replete with um, examples of how Mothers to Mothers um, have fostered connection, have fundamentally shifted mental models um, in terms of recruiting women with lived experience of HIV to form a powerful community of mother practitioners. Can you talk to us about that work, that really radical innovation, um, how it started, the trajectory of that work and where you are today, including in this era of COVID where your frontline healthcare workers were um, critical elements of an essential workforce over the last two years. Thank you, Cheryl. And uh, thank you again for being, for inviting Mothers to Mothers to be here and for inviting me to, to chat. This question around kind of how Mothers to Mothers basically radicalized the concept of psychosocial support and specifically in an epidemic like HIV AIDS where there's a lot of moving pieces. It's not just the diagnosis, it's an individual understanding that diagnosis. It's about that individual being able to be open about their diagnosis so that they can do the things they need to do. It's about being initiated onto treatment. It's about staying on the treatment and it's about managing a myriad of other issues so that we can get to a situation in which an individual can live healthily with HIV in their system and also not transmit to others. And what Mothers to Mothers did is we basically came in and we started very small with this idea of a woman from the community who spoke the same language as her, her peers not just the language of the community, but specifically the vernacular, was able to be the in between the doctor and the nurse who had no time. And especially when we started in 2001, uh, HIV was, was an epidemic out of control in Sub-Saharan Africa. So they took that, that space, that little space that we had of being in between a doctor and a nurse and providing one-on-one -on -one education and support. And one of the ways that I like to always think about it is one of our mentor mothers shared with me um, when I was in the field with her early on. And I asked her, I said, you know, what, what is so different and what is so special about what we do? And here is a woman who is living with HIV, has had two children that are HIV negative. She has done so much to be able to transform her life, make sure her children are born HIV free to the point where two years after we had this discussion, she was in an Annie Leibovitz exhibition because of her strength and her beauty in terms of women leaders. She said, Frank, it's very simple. When I sit with a client, I put my hand on her hands. I put them on her shoulder and I say, it's okay. Today, you will feel like this. In that moment, she is role modeling. She is showing this client that she knows exactly what it's like to be in her shoes. She is showing her that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to feel defeated. It's okay to feel. And then she says, I would take their hands and I would move them from their shoulders. And I would put her hands on my shoulders and say, and tomorrow you're gonna to feel like this. Transforming the space of, I've been where you are, you're gonna be where I am. And at Mothers to Mothers, what we did is we decided in 2001 when we started and up until now that we were not gonna be about scale immediately and we weren't gonna to try to reach everybody. We had a very specific focus. It was on mother to child transmission. And at the time we started, we were at about 30 to 40% of HIV positive women were having HIV positive children to the point where in Sub-Saharan Africa, there were about half a million children being born each and every year with HIV to the point that right now, this last year during COVID especially, mothers to mothers celebrated seven years in a row of virtual elimination of mother to child transmission. Our rate last year was 0.8%. And so, and that's reaching more than 1.3 million clients in a year, 
new clients. It's about us not just reaching moms and babies, it's about entire families. It's about providing services to where women are, where they stay, where they need that care. It's connecting individually. It's connecting an individual to a health system. It's connecting an individual in a community. And I think that's the power of what Mothers to Mothers is bringing. 12,000 HIV positive women that have been employed in our 20 years, over 13 and a half million women and children reached. And our focus has never been to be the biggest, but it has been to do really, really good work to make sure that we have excellent outcomes and to also make sure that we have sustainability. So we work really hard to make sure that this population of frontline workers that we are supporting, that we train them, we professionalize them, we support them, we are on a journey with them so that they can become full-scale community health workers, they can become government employees. Here in South Africa, also in Kenya, our mentor mothers have become government employees, they work for other NGOs, they have a ladder of success. And that's what we try to do in the 10 countries in which we work, Cheryl. Frank, it's it just it's extraordinary. Um, there's a line in the book that was really coming up for me when you were talking um, about your extraordinary work, Frank, and um, Cynthia and Francois say that rather than operating through economies of scale, organizations like Mothers to Mothers operate on economies of trust. And I think you just illustrated that so, so beautifully. And as part of the book and um, Cynthia and Francois really digging in on how you do it, um, they um, excavate this concept called havens um, and talking about how you build sort of the collective identity of the group and ways to get them to know and trust one another. And one of the tools and methods that they witnessed through your work was a process called body mapping, um, which I think you were just um, uh, alluding to, but tell us a little bit more about that or other practices that make real the concepts that are um, laid out in the book. I, I, I'm going to have to say that I'm, I'm struggling with the audio right now, Cheryl. I didn't get the last part of what you asked. Oh, I'm so sorry, Frank. These are the the the, the issues in, in, in our virtual world at the moment. I was just hoping there's such rich content that you shared with us, and we simply don't have enough time with you, Frank. But are there other specific practices that Mothers to Mothers uses to sort of forge the collective identity and to equip these extraordinary women as the problem solvers that they are? Are there practical, tactical examples that you'd like to share? Sure, thank you. Look, there's it's intense training, um, intense role modeling. It's an inverted pyramid in which mentor mothers, as they grow, they become site coordinators, they provide supportive supervision to other mentor mothers, they become district or provincial managers, they provide supportive supervision to others because they know what it's like. Mentor mothers hire other mentor mothers because they know what it's like to be in those shoes, they know what quality is. We provide tools, very specific tools, whether it's smartphones or tablets, and we provide lots of training, not just on how to use them, but what it feels like to use them, why it's important to use them. We spend time on helping our mentor mothers, our frontline workers understand the data and why they collect the data, not just collect it and then give it to us and then we will actually do something with it. We work with them on understanding how to analyze it, why those specific data sets are critical, what the order of those data and collecting information and why that's important. And I don't like to use the word empowerment because we don't empower anybody, but we provide tools, we provide education, and you can see the self-empowerment. You can see the individuals as they rise and step into their space to be able to do the work they do. Also being local, we don't hire women in Uganda to work in Ghana. They might train other women in Ghana, but they don't work in Ghana because they're not from that community. What that means is that as they grow in their own sense of self-efficacy, their strength, their leadership, they role model, not just to their clients, but they role model in their communities. They are living testaments of battling stigma. They are success. They are breadwinners. We make sure they are paid. 
And also 24 seven, unfortunately, those role models walk into churches, they walk into schools, they walk into the supermarket and our clients come and find them each and every time. I'll very quickly say I was walking across a marketplace with one of our mentor mothers and out of nowhere, a woman came and almost tackled her. And she said, wait, 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 I want you to meet my husband. And in that moment, we pivoted and the client had brought her husband and said, this is my mentor mother. I, this is the one who saved our lives. She's beautiful and I'm gonna be beautiful just like her. And that to me was literally mothers to mothers just in a full circle. It's beautiful, Frank. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to move to Jeru um, Billamoria now. Hi, Jeru. Um, I uh, Jeru has two of my favorite quotes uh, in the book. She talks about systems change requiring a major mindset shift for social change, and she also talks about how all of this work is essentially about how an outrageous idea. Um, not just becomes acceptable, but commonplace. That's the ultimate journey. And I think that so powerfully, powerfully speaks to what all of the groups highlighted in the book are doing. Um, and Jeru, your very career um, speaks to one of the, the practices of how you think about configuring power. And in the book, we get to know you through your extraordinary journey um, from um, child line to a flatoon from CYFI to Catalyst 2030. And you are identified as being a real expert in a process model for organizing. Can you sort of talk about that approach, your journey, and how that relates to the systems work that Cynthia and Francois are talking about in the book? Sure. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, I'll probably talk about it quickly from the point of view of the principles that they have brought about in the book. And firstly, I'd like to say all my learning, most of it comes from homeless men in New York and my street kids, whom I'm still very much in touch with because the one thing which they have said, which is also part of it is, we are voiceless and your role is to make our voices heard. And I think for me, that is the most important part. And I think that's also probably the most powerful part. Otherwise, just go away. Who are you? You want a nine to five job. So I think that's something which has been there. And that's been my journey throughout. How can we shift the power? How can we make and do it with a smile? I think that's most important also. So I'm going to talk about much more the latest uh, thing that I'm supporting and working with almost all the people who are on this call, all the social entrepreneurs, including you, Francois, Cynthia, everybody. Hilda, I see lots of people. We all came together to form Catalyst 2030. And Catalyst 2030 is this movement of social entrepreneurs. And what we really want is a seat at the table where we start shaping the policies that we want. How are we doing it? How do we make it happen? A, because of Echoing Green, Schwab, Skoll, Ashoka, all being there, we've already fostered uh, very, very strong connections. I remember having gone to so many meetings of Schwab Foundation, meeting Francois at school, et cetera. So getting everybody together, what is there in Catalyst 2030 is a strong bond and a collective trust. And with it, the collective goal to achieve the SDGs, but also more importantly, a collective goal to shape a whole sector of social innovators. So I think that is the way, and that's what brings the connection which is there. And when that happens, we start looking at how do we reconfigure power in terms of, so with Catalyst, what we've done is we had the awards where we started awarding positive behaviors from donors, from corporates, from governments. So we are changing the ecosystem and making them. Or we had actually the first time where all social entrepreneurs themselves came together with Catalyzing Change Week. And Cheryl, you inspired everything that was happening in the whole week and how we got the voices of the entrepreneurs at the forefront. And last but not the least is what's going to be launched on 20th September at the UN is the People's Report where our entrepreneurs from the front lines have collected 50, 
15,000 responses on what they think about the SDGs. By doing all this together as a collective, we are going to change the power dynamics. And I hope in 10 years, social entrepreneurs will be shaping most policies across all governments and doing it such that we are working with the people who've made it happen. My dream would be a street child shaping everything in India, but that's hopefully in 10 years. Having said that, over to you. I've tried to be very brief, keeping time in mind. Now, thank you very much, Jeru. And um, there's more um, information about Catalyst 2030 um, and six. And going back to Mirai's point um, about unlearning um, and thinking very differently about how we do the work and bringing funders into that unlearning process. Jeru, I think you've led Catalyst uh, 2030 masterfully in, in really shifting um, the way that we think about all of this. Um, we do not have enough time to, 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 to do questions, but we're gonna do the best we can with the 13 or 14 minutes we have left. I'm gonna start with one question and we'll do the best that I can to get as many in. So one uh, question um, from Blair, I Blair, um, he asks, um, I'd be interested to hear from Cynthia and Francois. Uh, let's see, where did the question go? Sorry about that. Uh, let me find it again. Uh, give me one second. Okay, he wants to know how you think and write about the politics of systems change. Blair says that too often in social entrepreneurship, we take technical approaches without understanding the incentives that drive power around change. Can you give an example of how an approach has embedded politics in ways that have led to systems change? Cynthia, should I start and then jump in? I, I, my, my, my first point was that all this work is intensely political. Uh, I think we certainly saw across all of the organizations, we haven't spoken about Nidan uh, from uh, Bihar and in India and Arbin maybe here, but we have featured him uh, in our Stanford Social Innovation Review session as well um, of how that building of the collective builds the power to then advocate for policy change, for um, uh, the creation of how uh, those those policies actually get implemented, uh, holding accountability at a local level, at a, at a macro level. And I think we also wanted to, to take a step back um, and, and look at, we've been speaking a little bit about the practices and the micro because we believe that's where it starts, but actually the work that CIWA has done has been over decades. The work that Mothers to Mothers and many other HIV organizations has been over decades. The work that um, Jeru has done with uh, street children and financial inclusion and mobilizing has been over decades and has actually created these really long arcs of change that have, you know, actually outlasted politicians, have outlasted other things uh, and, and, and have remained, but actually really transformed what we see as outcomes uh, over time in very significant ways, dealing with very complex issues that are, you know, both technical, but also very uh, kind of what we talk about in the book, transformational approaches. So dealing with the norms, dealing with stigma in HIV, dealing with um, patriarchy uh, in, in India, dealing with patriarchy around the world. So all of these issues, you know, it doesn't start by a, a government kind of changing a policy. It starts by actually changing all of our mindsets. And that can only really be done um, in through the micro practices and building that up over time. And so we wanted to explicitly connect and that's why the section on reconfiguring power is so powerful and also about platforms because it's through that that will actually have more sustained change. And that's what we found by, by, by looking at this, Not you know, the, the book looks over 200 years of social change history uh, in addition to these uh, kind of eight in-depth organizations. Cynthia? I think you've said it well, Francois. I'd love to be able to go on to other questions. So that was a beautiful example. And not surprisingly, people are um, trying to connect um, what you found to very practical, tactical approaches. And someone asked, how can funders uh, support systems change work? Well, I, I'll, I'll jump in and Francois, please add, um, you know, for us, the funder chapter, we, we have a chapter that actually looks at supporting actors and we consider funders to be supporting actors. Um, and we also talk about measurement, which also speaks to funding practices. I mean, first of all, timeframes, we're talking about um, uh, change that happens over decades, over generations. Um, so, and, and we know that funding cycles are often in these very um, finite one to three to five year um, chunks. And when we try to 
pigeonhole change into those very short spurts or episodes, we really do get ourselves into a knot. So I think funding timeframes is an absolutely key issue that we try to address a little bit in the book. Um, and then just in general, the restrictions and the reporting that comes with funding. Um, we talk about specific practices that funders can look at. Um, we, we even highlight some funders that are doing some really innovative things in terms of their trust-based participatory participatory-based funding, um, which I think are, you know, radical, but could easily move from the fringe to the mainstream and have a big um, impact on the way we do systems change. Francois, anything to add there? For anyone? Okay, wonderful. Um, I think, you know, uh, one of the, the many reasons that this book is so important is it's um, unapologetic um, discussion around power and how we need to shift it and seed it. Um, and it comes up time and time again in the principles and practices that you elucidate. And I think it's part of an ongoing conversation. Um, there's a Schwab thought leader, Julie Batalana, and her colleague, Tiziana Casario, who are um, set to release a new book called Power for All, how it really works and why it's everyone's business. And I think it will be um, a nice amplification of what you all share. And someone in the audience asked, I think a really important question, what can this shift or release of power look and feel like on the ground? How does it manifest? And that's for anyone, even our, our wonderful practitioners who are, are living this work every day. Can I jump in on that, if you don't mind? Please for, do. me, uh, for me, it would be that when the government shapes policies, say they have a new thing, for street kids. They actually talk to the kids and ask them rather than some bureaucrat writing the policy and calling in for experts. I think that's when it would be. When you have committees like we have, where the people who are actually affected sit on the table discussing with the policymakers. And then the bonds which come are when, I think one of in Aflatun, my biggest learning was, we had a school teacher. They were doing Aflatun, they went to another, they got transferred, they took the project along, and then they shape policy in that place. So it's the person, the community, and all of them coming together and change being an integral process. So it's, to me, that's what the shift will be. When the people who matter have a say in the change that has to happen. At, at least yeah. that's for me, sorry. Absolutely, Jeru. Any other examples? I mean, one that comes up in the book is from a funder that Cynthia and Francois talk about, Len Kelly Chase in the UK, that has been really on the forefront of thinking differently as how to show up as a supporting actor. And even things like the board of the foundation no longer having a say in who's funded, that participatory decision-making process, um, not empowering, as Frank said, sort of putting power into the hands of primary actors and the staff. I think that's a tactical, practical example. Um, other, other examples uh, before we turn it back to Francois to wrap us up? Well, just a, just a quick example from NIDAN. Um, the, the real policy that they made was around make, ensuring that street vendors are sitting on town committees. So like Jeru said, it's really about people having a place at the table and having a voice. And in that case, most of their work actually is in making those TVCs, those town vending committees work. So we talk a lot about in terms of power, it's not just about putting decision-making power in the hands of individuals, but ensuring that that um, power becomes a sustainable process. Um, so it's policies and patterns, they both have to work together. Um, that's just one other example from the book. Thank you, Cynthia. And I will say, I, um, I will embarrass Cynthia and Francois, this is an extraordinarily important book. Um, you know, it, it reminded me of one of my favorite books by Susan Orlean called The Library Book, which is ostensibly about the library, but is really a love story to reading and what the library represents. This is what this book feels like to me. The systems work of social change is, is a love story to all of those people who are working in their communities every day to make their lives and the lives of their family better. And it is a tribute to social entrepreneurs like Marai and Drew and Frank and so many others. It's extraordinarily important. So I really encourage you all to go read it, share it, um, and use it as a reference guide for years to come. Um, Francois, over to you. And thank you to you and Cynthia for this really important work. 
Thank you, Cheryl, and to uh, everyone for uh, hosting this great conversation. Just scratching the surface, and you know, this is about depth. So I'll go and read it. I'll make an announcement uh, in a minute about that. I, I wanted to welcome onto the screen, actually, so many people that we, we get to appreciate uh, for just one minute. Uh, I see Sheila Patel here from Slam Shack Dwellers International, uh, Arban Singh from Nidan, uh, Marlon and Renee Parker from Our Labs, all of whom were featured in the book. If they can turn on their um, videos, we'd love to see you for a minute. And Hilda Schwab is here as well, if it wasn't for the Schwab Foundation, uh, and Catherine Milligan and Hilda uh, in, uh, persuading Cynthia and I to do these case studies initially on, on these organizations. We, we wouldn't be here today. So a big thank you to everyone. Hello, Marlon and Renee. Thank you so much. Uh, are we looking forward to the South Africa launch with you on the 14th of October uh, as well? Um, I know Arbin and Sheila are here. So welcome and, and a big thank you. Stay on the screen. And so I can't put on the video. It doesn't allow me to. We can hear you. Uh, Sheila, there you are. Wonderful. We're, we're so delighted to have you here. Excited to hear this. This is music to my ears. And hello to Jeru and Mirai. We live in, we have such connected pasts, but we haven't met recently. But everything you say resonates beautifully with everything I believe. So thank you so much for today. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, Arburn, welcome as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up because the time is short. All of these organizations, again, we learned from because of the networks uh, of Ashoka and Skoll Foundation, of course, the Schwab Foundation and Echoing Green. Uh, Catalyst has been our amazing partner here. We wanted to mention three uh, quick announcements, important announcements for all Catalyst members. There will be a three-part workshop uh, on uh, the systems work of social change on October 5th, 12th, and 19th. Uh, and you can sign up for that on, on the link here. Uh, if you're not a Catalyst member, otherwise you'll need to become one to, to join in. So please do. Uh, secondly, to say the article, there is a, a, an op-ed going live now on Forbes at five o'clock. Uh, and uh, that will announce uh, the release of the book. And I'm really happy to announce with great thanks, we've not thanked yet uh, Oxford University Press who've been our, our publishers here and have been amazing in wanting to push this out uh, to this audience and get the message out. And for the next 10 days until the 10th of September, this book will be at a very nominal price of one pound uh, in the amazon.uk or $1.99 uh, on amazon.com. Uh, for the Kindle version for the next 10 days for anyone in this community, in the Catalyst community, in the Shwa Foundation community, and actually anyone that's available to anyone in the world at this price for 10 days. Uh, the point is to really tell the story as much as possible. The, the only deal on your side of the bargain is to please leave a review so that we can uh, ensure that uh, the book gets noticed beyond the circles of people that are already having this conversation. Uh, I think uh, that's it uh, from me. A big, big thank you. Uh, to everyone and in true uh, fashion from Geneva, Switzerland, we'll finish on the hour uh, with a video about uh, Slam Shack Dwellers SDI International. Uh, thank you to Sheila and the team and a special thank you to everyone behind the scenes who made today happen uh, from the Schwab Foundation team, the COVID Response Alliance team, uh, the World Economic Forum, Catalyst 2030 and all of our speakers today. Thank you so much for being here. Do get uh, your uh, very affordable version of the book. Uh, let us know what you think. Join the conversation on social media. And thank you again. And importantly, please continue all your work. Thank you, Cheryl, Mirai, Jeru, Frank, Cynthia. Take care. If we can play the video now.